Economics. I'm Panda. This is Dante Economics. We're going to talk about what it's like to work in application security. Yeah, so the whole purpose of this talk is uh, application security, and we wanted to kind of go in the day to day, which uh, I don't think a lot of talks kind of dig into, especially about like a specific uh, a job or, or duty or role. Uh, so we really kind of wanted to drill in on what it is actually like to be in application security or AppSec is what we call it. Um, so yeah, that's what uh, sort of spawned this whole thing. A little bit about myself. Um, we can all read. I'm not really going to go over that uh, verbatim, but essentially, uh, I consider myself a, a failed developer. Uh, it, it, once uh, I, I started to see my own websites get hacked, I'm like, okay, like clearly, I'm not really out like this. I need to figure this out. Um, and I was very fascinated about how certain things were happening, how certain attacks were happening. Um, so that sort of spawned me on this whole different path from kind of one side of the glass to the other, which was away from development, more into like how how hardening apps or um, just even penetration testing uh, as a whole. So it was a, a very interesting transition. It was nothing that I actually set out to do. It was just uh, kind of in, just the way this everything evolved of what I was doing at the time and the things that were uh, happening at the time in my career as a quote unquote uh, web developer. Um, yeah, so that's just pretty much myself. I believe we'll have these slides available. So um, there'll be more content you can read. I'm Amanda, uh, I actually transitioned from Center Medicine Currently, I work for a Fortune 100 doing application security. So, things that we're going to go over today, what is application security? There's a little bit of unknown of what application security is right now. Um, and then also, we're just going to see how the web app is. And then also, for the vendor side, what is it like in a vendor role? So what is an app? <laughs> does it? Does anyone know what an app is? <laughs> Thing on your phone or? Yeah, so it's just a program like it used to be desktop app, then it became web app, and now it's like phone app, like any app type of app. Yeah. So yeah, everything is kind of everything is an app, unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah, Web Actually is a computer program that essentially utilizes a web browser. So that's kind of more the realm that we're talking about. When we're talking about applications or our apps. Uh, they're more web web based. Uh, so with that, what is AppSec or application security? Oops. So it's basically the use of software, hardware, um, and some procedural methods to protect the application uh, from external and internal. This is important um, threats. And so some of these are the components that are in application security. So we just talked about uh, some of the methods uh, or like what application security is. So there's software. Software is involved and within software. We have like Fuzzers, uh, scanners, firewalls. Uh, on the hardware side of things, we have physical security, uh, hardware security modules, uh, firewalls as well, both software and hardware. And then the procedural methods, which are think more of um, the like the carbon side of things, the the processes, um, the the scans, the actual training, uh, implementation of things of that nature within the actual uh, organization in application security. So think of it as there's people, and then there's tools. And kind of both of those are required for like for the security side of things. So who owns an application? And it sounds like a very simple question, but it's actually a little bit more complicated once you dig into it. And when you're going into your application inventory, the three questions you're really trying to answer is who owns the application, what are the types of applications, and where do those applications live? <laughs> so who owns the application? Who's legally responsible for it? So if you work at a company that has multiple applications, they might be actually writing the code and they fully own it, right? Or maybe they're going to a vendor and asking them to build an application, or they're getting something that's already built that they can use and mess around. Right? So there's actually different portions of that. And then someone Aim for this somewhere down the line. So there's a fiscal responsibility as well. Maybe I'm the technical owner and I oversee the development team that's writing everything, but I don't pay for anything. There's someone else on the other side that actually does the thing. So, what are the different types of applications? You can kind of categorize them very broadly into three different ones the internal develop, staff, and third party. 
And then where are the applications hosted? So we talked about what types, now we're talking about like where do they actually sit? So um, tradition would be like on-prem. Most companies, the, the older school of thought is we have a, our, our office, we have a physical server, and then that's where whatever it is we're doing sits. Um, and then as we progress along, things become like remote is now sort of like a, a very common thing, um, if not even a standard now, depending on like where you're at. But so with that remote, now we have like uh, a data center, uh, and then we all also have like the cloud, which those two kind of go hand in hand. And then kind of to piggyback on a lot of this is uh, where they hosted are, are the internal and external. It kind of goes like on the types of applications, um, whereas an internal application is an application that you yourself, your company only has access to internally. Uh, the, no one from the outside can gain access to the application without certain rules. And then the external facing would be more like the public facing your your like a website, so to say, something that anyone from the inter internet could just easily get to by typing in the URL or an IP address. Uh, so that so where they're hosted also um, has a lot to do with the, the the actual like application security and then how certain degrees or levels of application security will play out depending on where they actually sit. Is it um, more of a issue if it's public facing where everybody can access this or is it more issue an issue if, if it's just internal and only employees employees can access that um, so where they're hosted plays i feel like a big role um, in the overall security posture <laughs> scan all the things um, and so with scanning um, part of the different processes manual and automated uh, some of these things may be familiar we'll just kind of do like a high overview of, of all of these so on the manual side, there's the actual code review, which is there's code in front of you and you can literally read the code and review it um, and then go through sort of uh, some testing at that point where you can maybe catch some things right away. Um, and then the flip side of that automation would be like the actual SAS, which is a, and now it's just an automated um, algorithm just reading the code instead of a human and then finding things that may, be, that may pose a threat or vulnerability. Um, and then on the manual side, uh, we have the penetration test which would be typically still manual in this day and age. There are some automation and tools for that, but for the most part, it's still, it's still a manual process. Um, and then we get all into all the automated stuff, which is the SAS, which is the, the static, like we talked about at the code level. Uh, very common is the, the DAS, the dynamic. That's more of uh, the application is up and running and you're, you're essentially um, f f scanning or figuring out the volumes that are in that. And that's typically probably one of the more popular ones because that typically represents the the like use most use case in the wild. Most attackers, hackers are going to be targeting some form of a, a, a running application as opposed to like getting to the code and, and modifying that and then and running that. Um, we have the, the the interactive application, which is very similar to DAS. And then we have the RASP, which is kind of on the WAF side, the firewall side, which is a runtime application. So that's actually something that's running at the application level um, and at the process level. So when a process comes in to, to run, the agent, if you will, uh, sees that or the engine, it sees that process and goes, this is uh, like, we shouldn't allow this process or we'll allow this process. Think of like a SQL injection. It sees that process where that process would normally have to like allow that to run. It could easily see that and say like, oh, like we shouldn't let this run. So we're not. So that's that's basically like the raft side of things where it's on the actual box running and it's sort of checking everything that comes in almost like an antivirus, uh, so to say. So those are the different types. Yeah. So uh, actually, Rapid7 provides a, a RASP. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure for open source for RASP, but open source does do have um, other the DAS and plenty of SAS tools. And SAS is usually done like at the the code level, like we talked about, like and per code. So there's like a SAS for PHP. There's like a a SAS for uh, Java or something like that. You usually have like little modules that you would run. Where DAST is definitely more, again, we're talking about like more of the runtime it's running. Uh, that does have to take into consideration some of the frameworks and languages, but at, at the core, it's really just doing like a, a vuln test essentially. Um, so I'm not too sure about some of the open sources, but the majority of the players in AppSec uh, offer one or if not all of these uh, applications and services. Correct. Like a traditional WAF is like an older school technology where think of it as an actual firewall in front of the application where a RASP is actually running on the application. So now we're talking about like the process level of allowing or not allowing uh, an action to take place versus um, just a set of like maybe arguments that the WAF would hit where it's like 
it doesn't meet its criteria, allow it or not allow it. Almost like a firewall rule is like a, a WAF. And the RASP is more literally at the process level of this code came in to execute. Does it meet these criteria? It's still, you know, like an algorithm, so to say, and then allows it or doesn't allow it. Uh, so yeah, but think of this as like if it's a web app. Uh, this is more particular to like a web instance, web application environment, as opposed to any other asset or any other like runtime environment. So that we're talking specifically like uh, applications running, web applications running. Um, and then the RASP itself usually involves some sort of what we call like an agent, where it's installed on the box, and again it's running on the box, and then it's sort of reporting. So every either every server or whatever application you have, you would install these agents. They would all kind of call home. You would log into home and that would give you like a readout of everything that's happening uh, for all your applications. So um, to me, they're very similar. Uh, and there's not a lot as far as from how I differentiate. I think more it's like either a marketing thing or at least um, at the overall level, I think the highest level of the DAS versus the IAST is really it's it's uh, scanning the the environment that's running. Um, um, so I think I think I, I consider DAS and IAST the close brothers, like siblings. Uh, where the the SAS and the RASP, I feel like are very different from those two, and they're very different from each other. Yeah. Uh, and so now that we have vulnerabilities, so we've, we're we're doing some scanning. Um, where what do we do with the vulnerabilities who should they be passed to as far as like actual owners Yeah, I think risk risk level is probably the most common that most businesses make their decisions on whether or not what the SLA for the patching is going to be, how quickly are they going to get to it, and then and then yeah, mark it down or whatever as far as, or or mark the vulnerability up. Right, there has to be priority set. Exactly. So a high, an internal high could could be from an external purpose, like null, like doesn't exist from the, from the outside. So yeah, lots of things to take into consideration um, in the risk. Yeah, and you'll also find there's a lot of metrics also around um, like how long is it the, the vulnerability been out? Because usually the longer something has been out, the more it's been weaponized. So the greater the risk of a possible attack, uh, or you know, a, a, because because it's been around for so long, which is why we still see to this day like SQL and XSS are still so common, but they're like, they're like ancient you know findings. 
so, so yeah, the risk uh, is, uh, I'd say, plays a massive role in the, the criteria of like how, like what, how do we uh, approach, you know, patching and, and things of that nature. question <laughs> so um, there's a few reasons and, and some of the, there's a lot more than what's listed here but I, I feel like these four are probably the more common reasons of why a company might go to the vendor and this is sort of all going to the whole purpose of the talk is the vendor side client side and like a day in the life so we'll, we'll get there um, so a vendor provides a few things one of the reasons is maybe lack of actual knowledge maybe there's a company they have no idea what even application security is how to implement it any of that so hey let's just pay this other company to, to do that uh, lack of experience maybe they do have a team and they're a small team or even large team but that team is inexperienced they just they just want to start rolling this thing out and they don't want to they would they still want to have the coverage they don't want to wait for these guys to ramp up and then have awesome coverage so basically let's pay this team to do this that's third party while we ramp up our own internal processes so we can make this transition transition of letting them go and then and the company continues lack of resources same thing um scanning people scanner and people um so the resources again it's funding the tools and the resources and the people to do said thing and then again there's the cost sometimes it might be uh, cheaper to hire a third party to do your security than it is to do your own internal um, security. So those are there's other reasons, but these are the main I think four that kind of play into the role of why you might handle uh, go out for third party. Uh, what are some of the roles and responsibilities? Uh, so we're going to go over kind of the roles, and we kind of need to speed through these. We're running out of time. So on the client side, you have CC related to CISOs, CTOs, CIOs, uh, governance groups, compliance officers. Legal, all of those people are decision makers. And you also have your engineer, so your developer, your chief admin that's actually deploying, and the technical owner who maybe is not doing the coding but is still responsible for the team that is. And then on the vendor side, you're kind of going through the process of uh, interaction, it'd be a sales team, maybe some kind of non technical liaison that's uh, assigned to like that person, that account. Um, a consultant maybe does the, the deployment of uh, said you know job. Uh, advisors like myself, we're sort of assigned to that, uh, that that account, and we are the technical advisor, security advisor for, for everything that we're doing for that uh, for the entity. Um, scan operations, they're more of the backside of um, the third party uh, on the technical side, and then support. Obviously, if the company that's hiring us to do something, if they have an issue, they need to be able to reach out to support to have something um, uh, fixed or addressed. 
And so now we'll break out into the actual day in the life of what it is actually like uh, for to do our daily jobs. So my job can kind of be broken up into four main components. It's kind of a snapshot of all the weeks, really. Um, I do home facility management. I do And so with that is basically where I would step in as a vendor. Um, so sit rep, the first thing I do in the, every morning, wake up, check emails. Basically, has anything happened during the night that I need to address immediately? Um, basically, any fires that need to be put out. Did, did our scans knock something over, destroy something? Um, did, we, did we fill up databases with just random garbage, which we, we all we, we do a lot of? Um, basically, again, anything that happened that requires me to hop on a phone call immediately with, said, say, Panda, to say, hey, what's going on? Did, did something break? Um, and then on the scanning side of things, so we've done whatever damage uh, you know, situations that may have occurred or may not have occurred. Um, so now I start checking like, hey, what are some other scans that I'm responsible for? Um, have those kicked off? Did any of them fail? Are they still trying to run? Um, and then once all that's done, we get back to vuln validation, basically going through all the findings and then checking to see if the exploits uh, are actually a valid exploit um, for that company within their actual environment. Again, my goal is by the time that I deliver the report to Panda, that the only findings that they need to worry about are the, are the all validated findings. So we might do a scan and find 500, but we've actually whittled that down to maybe like a, a few, like a handful of actual findings that are actual, can be exploitable in their environment. And so those are the ones that we would prefer them to act on and to worry about patching. And the other ones are just basically you know, non-existent. Um, and then going back to, uh, uh, how we like judge, or I, like, I have a very good reputation with, with Panda and her company. So I know that maybe certain findings we need to upgrade or downgrade because of their environment or because of their specific requests, because maybe their internal uh, compliance says any and all XSS, regardless, or we're going to treat that as a high or a medium. And it may be an actual low, maybe XSS didn't actually work, but it caused a stack trace. So maybe that's part of recon. We weren't actually able to like store or reflect something, but it broke the app some way. But they're still, they still want that to be a high as opposed to we might consider that an actual low because no access actually happened, but the app acted in a way that it wasn't supposed to. So that's still maybe a finding that maybe something could, could occur from just uh, having that knowledge. Um, and then going back to uh, the management side, uh, the reports um, and scheduling time. So at some point, I would want to sit down with Panda and her team to go over those findings of, hey, this is what we found. Here's how we maybe think you should try remediating. Maybe they're looking to us for con consulting. Maybe their team is just fine and they just want those, the, the numbers and the metrics and the reports, but it's still a good relationship to have um, uh, for both both teams because even though we are a vendor, uh, we, we kind of, we still tend to want to think of ourselves as just like an extension of the company that we're helping and not just like some random, you know, stranger third party. So we want to be very, very integrated in what it is they're doing so we can help them and their security posture you know, move along um, in that space. 
Um, so with all of that, now that you kind of have a very quick and rough idea of uh, AppSec and what it is, that what we actually do in the space, um, some ideas of some things maybe to get into uh, to help get that journey uh, start. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And we see that a lot with either fuzzing or SQL injections where we maybe didn't dump data or find out anything specific, but we got a result back that, that, that should be addressed by the application owner. Um, and I see that a lot with uh, SQL and XSS or, or fuzzing, where maybe we're trying to actually pull data out, but instead we crash the application. But sometimes in a crash, you get a stack trace. And that, that could be very useful information because maybe now I know the platform, what type of database you're using and other info, maybe even paths and things like that. So, so that should be, error handling is, uh, I think, a big part that's overlooked in a lot of applications. Um, and there's a lot of recon that you can do just by crashing an application. So. Big business impact to the application. Absolutely, because maybe that's my goal is to, to bring it down. I mean, you know, so there's definitely something to say for, for those types of uh, vulnerabilities, even if it's not what was intended. And that was more of a, like a byproduct. Um, so these are some ideas of kind of what to, uh, maybe if, again, if you're looking to get into application security, um, obviously you don't necessarily need to be like a master at these, but knowing these uh, will go a long way. Um, and some of the common tools, uh, there's a lot of them out there, but these are probably the, the more common tools that you'll run into. Um, a lot of these I will literally use daily, I'm sure as Panda does as well. So um, there's a handful that, that you'll use daily. There's maybe another handful that you'll every once in a while go to. Um, application security is kind of a, a small space. It's, I don't want to say it's usually an afterthought, but there's all, a lot of other things that companies are usually more focused on with their security, like deployments of internal network, you know, intrusion, uh, asset scanning and things like that. Um, it's just as important, but again, it's usually considered like a smaller department, smaller teams. Um, and so with that, there's usually not a ton of tools. I mean, if you're in, in this industry, there's a good chance you've heard of the tool or the, whatever it is that someone is bringing to the table or it does the same thing something else does. So it's it's kind of good that it's kind of a, a small community like that, but it's just as important as all of them. And... Tips, advice, but not money. No, money, but not advice. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Um, you talked about having a vendor coming to do all this stuff. And I just told a lot of times you do working at So usually when we come in, we're very aware of what we're scanning. There's there's no time where a company is going to hire us and say, scan our apps, but but we don't know the apps. So it's going to be like, here's a list of our apps uh, and scan. So it is different perspectives, different goals, I think different jobs. But uh, as an, uh, it is nice to, I think, hire a, a third-party vendor sometimes, regardless of the space, because they can come in objectively and see 
where where are you at? Where do you where you should you be in this in your security posture? Um, but also, it gives it's kind of like watching two people play checkers or chess. When you're watching, you can see all these moves, but when you're in it, you're maybe distracted. There's a lot of other things going on. So there's a lot of times where we'll stumble across things outside of just oh we scanned your app. It's also like oh we scanned your app and then found this, and then there's like you pull that thread and it leads to a lot of other things that wasn't maybe intentional in the beginning, but because we are the outsider. Uh, we we kind of have that like high overview scope of well where could this actually lead us even though you're just telling us oh scan this give us vulnerabilities we, we're doing this and then going oh and by the way like there's yeah yeah we're you know so it's it's yeah there's a lot of i think a lot of reasons why both both work it's not a right or wrong or better or worse it's just i think having the ability to maybe hire a third party a vendor sometimes works really well and that's very common we have a lot of team or a lot of uh companies that have their own team and will work alongside their team because that's just how they want to implement their security. It could also be used as you have two teams, which ha happens quite often as well, where it's almost a way of doing validation. If team A and B found the same thing, there's a good chance that that's a legitimate find. And again, so now the company doesn't really have to worry about going through the measures of do we need to retest this to actually validate. It looks like it's been validated because two separate entities found the same thing, almost like an audit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is very common. I mean, it's, it's also part of our jewel. As uh, as we hate to find those things, we love to find those things. Um, and there have been instances, and you also have to think of um, we as the vendor are specialists in this field. Um, whereas the company may not have, have specialists or it could it could also be the sense that maybe company has high turnover or maybe teams have moved and come and gone and things get lost and procedures get lost. So there's a constant that you can kind of bring into that environment because even the best the best company is still going to have turnover of some sort. People are going to come and go or move even within the company. So again, if you have this constant that comes in that says, hey, this is what we do, this is what we do you know, for everyone. And so this is kind of, Again, and we tend to look at things differently, whereas internal teams look at things, I feel like, with a little bit, some blinders. And the, and the outside team, I think, is as a broader scope sort of to look at things and know where things can go um, with some of the findings. And, that, and it happens quite often where I had a finding that had been there for maybe 10 years that we, that we found. And there's a good chance that we weren't the first people to find that, obviously. So, but again, it goes, and this particular company has high turnover. So it, there's... And at the end of the day, like they need to figure out well, why did that exist? But again, it's something that we found that they clearly have not found ever. Um, so there's definitely, I think, benefits to having an outside team. <laughs> yeah.
I think a lot of that, though, to expedite a path would be learn, basically figure out all the tools of the space, like anything, and then learn some of the tools. Like like any gig, it all really comes down to like the tool, and then there's day to day things. No, no matter what you know, there's going to be like this is the set things I, I'm going to be doing every day. So the tools for sure, and then I think outside of that, knowing how the tools work, and to be able to do some manual things because most tools are always automating everything. To be able to go back and then manually rep, like replicate what the tools are doing. And then I think just having an understanding, but I think to fast track any career would be, I would say start at the tool level because there's so many paths even within application security. But I think that it kind of all starts at the tool and then knowing that really well. And then just knowing that is, there's a, probably a good chance that if you were to go apply somewhere, especially if you know what, what company A tool, what they use, if you already have that, that's, that's a really good experience. Whereas when you now come in, now less time for you to have to ramp up internally. And like every company is like how, how fast can I get this employee like up and running and like actually like putting out stuff output for the company? So if you already are familiar with the tools, they look at that as like, okay, this this would be a fast ramp up. We can actually get him doing work for us like very quickly as opposed to he's never heard of or seen the tool before. And now we have to figure out how this person can, we got to train him on the tool and then, and then move on. So I think learning the tool is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll we'll get all these slides out too. I think it'll be accessed. No, it's good. The, in the soft the soft skills is like is legit, is a legit thing, and I mean you have to realize that you don't necessarily know who your audience will be, and, it's, and the audience is going to vary. It, it will be devs, it will be C suite, it will be PMs, it will be everybody. So you really need to be able to talk at all those levels kind of confidently. So tools is important. Soft skills is extremely important again because you have to know your audience. Your audience is always going to change, um, especially like at a, at a vendor level, but even internally you're going to have certain audiences along the path. And so you really need to be able to talk at every level um, just to get your point across or like, you know, to let someone know about a vuln or, you know, to talk to a developer and, and because developers, I feel like are very sensitive in their work because they feel like you're calling their baby ugly. So they don't want to hear that you've broke it or found something terrible. So you got to, again, soft skills, delivery of how can you sort of massage that conversation um, you're going to get things done. Because at the end of the day, it's all the same team, but a lot of times it doesn't feel like that. But, and that's, you need to address that, that you're all on the same team. The goal is for the, the better of the company. Yes. Yeah. 